dan sekali lagi selamat datang semuanya ke New College uh, Majlis Pemuda Lecture ke-9 tahun 2015. Uh, seperti Pak Risa jelaskan, uh, I have the honor of uh, being associated with uh, PUSAD this year. Um, I'm a research fellow um, and uh, look forward to learning uh, from PUSAD and Pakistan and, and a very enthusiastic team of, of young researchers. Uh, that they have. Um, I'm also honored to serve as moderator for Professor Chaiwat. The group left, perlu saya sampaikan bahwa bahasa Indonesia saya masih sangat terbatas. Jadi mohon maaf jika ada Tahun ini, tema No College Major Global Lecture adalah ini pesan dan kebajikan bersama. Dan kita sangat berterima kasih atas kehadiran Profesor Syaibat Pasalan yang akan menyampaikan kuliah umum malam ini. Dengan segala hormat, saya mengundang Profesor Anang untuk naik ke panggung. Profesor Anang. Profesor Chaiwat juga dikenal luas sebagai pemikir, aktivis dan feminis yang rajin mengkampanyekan uh, panggilan nir kekerasan agama dan budaya perdamaian. Karena itu, Profesor Anand kiri dipercaya sebagai senior research fellow di Institute for Global Peace and Policy Research dan penasihat akademis untuk International Center for Nonviolent Conflict. Profesor Anand juga memperoleh beberapa penghargaan pada 2012, uh, 2012, uh, 2012 Profesor Anand dianugerahi Sri Purapa National Award karena sumbangannya dalam bidang perdamaian dan hak hak uh, hak asasi manu- manusia. Pada tahun yang sama, Profesor Anand diberi penghargaan Al Hibri Peace Education Prize International oleh Al Hibri Foundation. Tema kuliah umum Profesor uh, Chaiwat malam ini sangat signifikan karena sangat relevan dengan uh, tahapan demokrasi Indonesia sekarang. Demokrasi itu memberi ruang yang lebih besar untuk memperjuangkan keadilan. Dan uh, argumen Profesor Chaiwat mengenai bagaimana ni kekerasan itu bisa menjadi uh, weapon atau senjata yang tajam Uh, untuk memperjuangkan keadilan seperti ini saya rasa sangat signifikan uh, untuk bagaimana uh, hal-hal ini bisa dilakukan di Indonesia. Uh, mari kita beri sambutan yang meriah kepada Profesor Anand. Profesor Anand, waktu dan tempat kami persilakan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Kala Rabbi Shrahli Sadri Yassiri Amri Wahlulu Datam Milisani Yafkahu Kauli Assalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh Salamat Malam I wanted to first uh, say to all of you here how I feel to have been invited by University of Farah Madinah uh, One of the reasons among many that I have accepted this invitation was of course because of Nukhalis Majid. And I wanted to say a few words about him. Uh, Nukhalis and I worked together in a project 20 years ago when we started something called ASEAN Forum for Muslim Social Scientists. Uh, That was the first time that we wanted to bring together uh, Muslim social scientists, meaning people who are Muslim engage in works for society, but trained in um, social science and philosophy. Nur Kalish, as a student of uh, Fasul Rahman from the University of Chicago, came with 
much more than we have. And in the process of our collaboration for many years under the project, and I should say that it was funded by the Asia Foundation uh, in the beginning, um, we had several uh, meetings, uh, twice in Thailand and then once in Mindanao, in Marawi City, uh, and then uh, the fourth one, the last one, was in Indonesia. And the organizer at that time was uh, Pak Dawam Rahajo, uh, many of you might know, from LPTKES. So these things were talking about issues facing Muslim communities, Muslim societies, uh, with concern for Islam, but using the language of social science and philosophy to deal with it. But Jack Nu always is in a way a guiding light for, for me personally and all of the friends in the group. When we go to places to have conference and we sometimes pray together, I told him that I was very happy to follow him as an Imam. Not only because of his knowledge, but because of his civility and because of his wisdom. I think those things was been his legacy. And you can see it here, yep. the institutional legacy that he has left us, the Paramadina. And for that, I am uh, very proud of uh, the honor given to me for the invitation today. And I wanted to, to thank Director, uh, Chair of the Board, Pak uh, Yassan, and his team for the wonderful work uh, in making it possible for me to be here. So I wanted to... Uh, begin with today. Today is October 6th. And October 6th means so much to me because that it was the day that changed my career. I did not begin my interest academically and otherwise as a peace researcher. But I must tell you that it was the incident on October 6th, 1976 that changed everything. That was the day when my university, Thammasat University, was attacked by paramilitary force. Uh, students were there to protest against the return of former dictator. Uh, he came casting himself in the yellow robe, uh, and we as students and, and NGOs and others protested against his return, thinking that that will usher in a new uh, dictatorship, uh, and it did. But the way in which it was brought up, brought about uh, on October 6th is that my university was attacked and students were killed, thousands arrested, uh, and the brutality was unprecedented. Unprecedented in several ways. This is just one of the picture of how dead people were mutilated, people were burned alive, uh, women, uh, students stripped off their shirts, um, uh, stakes uh, driven through the hearts, almost unimaginable. And people never thought that that could have happened uh, in the heart of the city, in, if you will, from the Buddhist point of view, on the holy ground, because next to Tamasaj University is, was the temple, is the temple of the Emerald Buddha uh, and the Grand Palace and everything. And the thing that hurt the most, if you will, was not the guy who was it, hitting uh, the dead body of a student, but the way that the people looked at them. And there were people who were clasping, there were people who were smiling, and that I cannot tolerate. And even today, when I look at the picture uh, years later, on today, you know, October the 6th, it, it tells me something about Thai society, that we live in a myth of Thai society, thinking that Thai society is a peaceful society. But in my lifetime, uh, we have experienced so many violent incidents, and this one was the worst. Because we experienced this brutality in the heart of the city while people were laughing. And that set me on the course to find some answer. I had no choice. Like many of my friends, a lot of my friends went to join the Communist Party of Thailand to fight the government at the time. Uh, I did not follow in that footstep, but I was looking for a way out of the country. So I left uh, the country when I got the scholarship 
uh, from the Space Center. I went to the University of Hawaii and I met my teacher, Professor Glenn B. Page. He taught a course called Nonviolent Political Alternatives. And if anything I learned from him, I learned that there are indeed alternatives to, non to violence. And that these alternative, nonviolent alternatives, there are grounds of knowledge to support it. I think that is in line with my thinking. You know, I, I don't like the preaching side of peace, but I like argument, I like evidence to show me that this work. And I learned that from him as a, you know, a political scientist. And so um, he started me on this uh, journey. So I decided to work with him on my dissertation. I changed the original plan and started to work on something uh, on, political, on political philosophy and, and uh, nonviolence. And uh, for those of you who are interested, the title of my dissertation was called The Nonviolent Prince. It's a rereading of Machiavelli the Prince from a nonviolent perspective. And it got, uh, you know, uh, nominated for International Dissertation Award, but it was never published because people said I should die first and then let it publish. <laughs> I'll do that. Uh, and then later, years later, Glenn started another thing which is relevant to the topic today. He organized the first ever, I would say, international conference on Islam and nonviolence here in Indonesia. That's when Abdul Rahman Wahid and many others joined. Uh, and then we have the Egyptian philosopher Hassan Hanafi and many others joined in, in, in the process. And we have that at Bali Shanti Daiba, uh, Gedong Bagos Oga, at that time she was still alive, so we had a meeting right there. And that was the beginning of uh, my interest. And, and the assignment Glenn told me is that you have done your work on violence on issue and you are a Muslim and you are interested in nonviolence, do something about it. And so I wrote the piece on the nonviolent crescent. And that led to many other things. The, the conference was supported by UN University in Tokyo at the time. And if I'm not mistaken, the rector of the UN University at the time was another Indonesian. Sajan Moko, yes. So you have the Indonesian connection all through of this project, if you go back in time. Uh, and that gave rise to the first ever conference on nonviolent action in the Middle East. That was done in Amman, Jordan. And there you have all kinds of big names in the field of peace research, international relations. Uh, people like Johan Gautung, uh, the father of modern peace research. Jean Sharp himself was there. Um, Abdul, Sayed, Abdul Aziz Said from uh, uh, American University and many others were there. Um, and we had this uh, work on nonviolence and the Middle East in the first, uh, first conference there in 1987. And it came out in the book, published also in Arabic and in English. So that's the beginning of uh, Islam and nonviolence. So 30 years later, this picture, the death of Alan Kurdi in September 2015, I think it changed the world. But it changed the world in terms of the policy. It brought us to an issue facing uh, global problem, I mean, facing uh, the world today, uh, the issue of refugee. But if you look at the death of this child and you ask where does he come from, he's only three years old. He's Syrian. He came from a town called Kobani in Syria, and he wanted to move from Kobani to some other places. So he went in a, in a boat to the city of Kos. In the end, you know, he ended up uh, on the shore of a Turkish beach resort, only three years old. And it creates some ripples within world policies regarding humanities, refugees, and others. And Europeans begin to question what is going on, you know, the intake of refugees and others. It's, I think this is important. So the question I'm asking myself, you can see the power of one picture, the death of a shy, how it changes policy. So the meaningfulness of, the meaning of, 
of one child, I think is fascinating in that sense. I'm interested as a Muslim peace researcher in persuading Muslims to explore nonviolent alternatives based both on inspirations from the treasure of Islamic faith as well as knowledge of how nonviolent actions actually work uh, in the harsh world of politics. And I would say that this child, I think, is the beginning of our journey. This is the reaction that you can see all over the world. Some data on refugee problems in Syria. But then, why do you have a death like this, needless death like this? Where does this refugee come from? And you can talk about you know, the role of great powers, uh, the role of uh, 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 Syrian government, uh, the fight on the ground, uh, and all that. But those things, in the end, boil down to that picture, the life of a child. The thesis of tonight's talk is simply this. The pursuit of nonviolent alternatives will make it possible for Muslims to hold on to two fundamental principle, Islamic principles of protect innocent lives such as Lord Kurdi while fighting for justice in the world. I think these are two <laughs> foundational principles of Islam. So for me, Islam is not quite the religion of peace. Actually, the term I choose is near Kekarasan, not Damai. And there's a difference between the two. Because, yes, people will argue that the notion of Salam means peace and, you know, the root of the word uh, Salma and others. But what it is for Islam, for my understanding, is that it is a quest for a just world. If you're talking about peace, it's a just peace. It's not only you know, peace in the you know, pacification uh, sense or simply an absence of war. So on the one hand, you are in pursuit of that. On the other, you have, protect, you have to protect innocent lives like those of Island Kurdi. How do you do that? That's why you need an alternative. The root of this thesis, if you like music, then you can think of this as movement. And there are five movements uh, here. Uh, the first one is worse. I mean, you can have only five words uh, about this tonight. The first word is worse, ayah. The second one is weapon. The third is arguments. Um, the fourth is, I cannot see. And then, the fifth one is choice. The first is about inspiration. I'm a social scientist. I'm interested in philosophy and theory. But as a Muslim, I seek my inspiration from the source that I revere, and that is Islam. And so I begin the discussion with the verse. The second part is about how I understand nonviolence. And I think that needs to be put on the table to see, uh, to understand, to appreciate how different it is from Damai. The third is the argument I wanted to make, you know, along the line of why, you know, I would argue that uh, nonviolent Christian is important and why nonviolent action becomes Islamic imperative. The title of the book is Nir uh, Kekarasan Dan Kewajiban Islam is not Kewajiban and Nikkekarasan Islam. I argue strongly that this is an Islamic imperative. So I would, I would defend the, the thesis that way. And then why is that? Because I think people in this room are not ordinary academics. There are academics who leave the world aside and are interested in simply understanding it. I think we are more than that. I think Nukhalis Majid and his legacy means to me more than that. It means that we have to do something about the world that we don't like. When I teach research to my students, I said one of the most important things for you to begin to do research is sometimes to get angry. So for me, anger.
can be the beginning of research. Why? If you look at statistics or case studies of violence against children in a society, and you realize that in Thai society, the number of children violently abused has been as low as six months old, the number of children abused was on the rise, the degree of brutality is heightened, and if you look at all of this and you are not angry, you have a problem. So you should be angry with the world and then do something about it. And that's what I'm interested in as engaged Muslim, as a peace researcher and as engaged Muslim. And then the last one is of course choice. The words that I choose, many of us know very well, uh, Paul Neil was talking to me that this verse is all but forgotten uh, from the, you know, Mimbar and uh, Kutbah and anywhere in, in Indonesia. I'm not sure he's right. Uh, I don't know, but you can test it. But uh, the verse is from uh, Surah Al Maidah and chapter uh, uh, the piece or Ayah 35. And the Quran says this Because of this did we ordain unto the children of Israel that if anyone slays a human being, Unless it be punishment for murder or for spreading corruption on earth, it shall be as though he had slain all mankind. Whereas if anyone saves a life, it shall be as though he had saved the lives of all mankind. The complex verse contains fascinating treasures on issues of violence and nonviolence in Islam. First, this verse follows the story of Adam's two sons, Cain and Abel. The Quran says that when one son threatens to kill another, the brother replies that he will not respond with killing. This is interesting. Cain killed his brother. He was filled with remorse and became one of the losers. The Quran says he became one of the losers. The fact that Abel did not raise his hand against his prospective killer and that God did not punish the killer with death signifies how complex the response to the issue of killing in Islam is. As a result, the Quran teaches that slaying, and the word used is katala, one human being is equivalent to or is like slaying all humankind. While saving one life, ahya, is also equal, equal to saving the lives of all humankind. Second point, while killing and saving one life is equal to doing so to the whole humankind, I think it is important to note that the weight of taking a life, meaning killing, and saving a life is not equal. After pointing to the complexity of the act of killing, importantly, including the effect of killing on the killer, and here I think uh, this creation from the Quran is very advanced in terms of understanding violence, peace research, and others. That is one of the trends that people interested in the issue of violence now is paying attention to is the effect of violence on the perpetrators, not on the victims alone. You know, and that is the issue that quite, uh, is quite interesting. Um, so the Quran stipulates, um, the Quran stipulates conditions for allowing such an act. The act of killing will only be possible if the one killed committed murder him or herself or has caused corruption on earth. The condition stipulated here concerns one of the gravest sins in Islam, murder and causing corruption on earth. And this is in the Hadith, as you know, there are four kinds of things, sins. Murder is one of them. On the other hand, the directive to save a life does not have any condition attached. Could one therefore say that the unconditionally, unconditionality of saving a life outweighs taking a human life under certain conditions? Third. When I look at the Arabic words for slaying a human life and saving a life, I found that the Quran used different words. It says Qatala Nafsan and Ahyaha and Ahyanas, which are translated as killing a human being and saving a life in the English translation. But the words Nas and Nas are different because while the former signifies the soul or the desire that is human, the latter means more of a human in the flesh. If one reads this verse back to the story of Cain and Abel in the earlier verses, then when the Quran says that Cain the killer has become a loser, does it mean that he has lost his soul? Meaning 
in the act of killing, the killer lost his soul. Does it say that killing is so grave a sin because in killing another, the killer him or herself will have lost his or her own soul? In a more sophisticated manner, I would argue, the Quran is pointing both to the person who has lost his or her life because of the killing and the effect of the act of killing on the killer. He would lose his soul and therefore killing him is not called for. In fact, if you follow, uh, for example, the Bible, then the founding of the city was done by Cain. So Cain was the beginning of the society and city, you know, not Abel. So the killer found the city. In fact, most of the cities are found by killer in a way. Uh, and the origin of government uh, in the world or the state in the world is mafia. More important than that, I think, is the puzzle that comes with the verse. How can killing or saving a soul or a life equals to the killing or saving the whole humankind? I think this puzzle contains a most unusual quantification problem of a single human life. Unlike Tolstoy's Christian notion of the kingdom of God is within you, or the idea of connectedness of all lives in Hinduism, which can readily be seen as the basis for nonviolence principle. Islam is different. Of course, one can argue that the Hindu's notion of life and connected, connectedness of life is similar to Ibn Arabi, Wahdatul uh, Wujud, Unity and Diversity, and others. But I think Islam's principle of nonviolence points to how one human life is equal to the whole of humankind. And therefore, taking one human life is almost unimaginable unless one is prepared to kill the whole humankind in such an act. Imagine for a moment, if you are going to be a terrorist, if you are going to be a soldier, if you are going to be a killer, and you realize that the act of killing that one person means you kill the whole of humanity. The magnitude of the act will be ex extremely, you know, unfathomable. And I think the decision making will change. So, I would argue that how one human life is equal to the whole of humankind and therefore taking one human life is almost unimaginable unless one is prepared to kill the whole humankind in such an act. The reason why Detang was working in international relations is because the nuclear weapons is considered absolute weapon. Not only because uh, no sides can win, but because of the destructive consequence of, of the weapon itself, which outweigh the use of that weapon. So to contemplate the meaning of this way of quantifi quantification of human life is to construe the ways in which a life is seen in a web of relationship with the whole of humanity. That one life is equal to all lives is possible because from a cosmic perspective, this is not unlike when we see a grain of sand which contains the lifetime of the whole planet. Tomorrow, if you go to the beach, you pick up a grain of sand. And the test is to look at the sand and see the whole planet, because it's as old as that. So in that sense, a single grain can be equivalent to the whole of the, uh, in terms of time of the planet as well. So to see one life as equal to all lives means, among other things, to be able to see the others as a world in and of him or herself, and to also see oneself in that world, especially when that others are made to be the enemy, who perhaps have blood of one's family on their hands. Through such a powerfully enchanted sight, saving one life can be understood as saving the lives of the whole humankind. This is perhaps why in seeing the picture of a single shy, Island Kurdi, killed as a result of a war in Syria, the task of thinking and acting to save such a life becomes an Islamic imperative for Muslims. It goes without saying that if there were no war in present-day Syria, Alan Kurdi's life would have been saved. Syria had a chance with the use of nonviolent action in the early days of the Arab Spring. In fact, in 2011, in the town, for example, of Dara, uh, groups of activists were protesting against uh, uh, Assad in using nonviolent uh, action and demonstration. They were arrested. Due to a number of factors, it was brutally stolen from the Syrians. 
to save the innocent life such as islands would mean for Muslims to explore and strengthen the curse of non the cause of nonviolent action as necessary alternative in the conduct of politics. The sad part is that as we speak today, Putin has decided to help Assad bombing Syria. And so we'll aggravate the situation. So Putin will join Obama in making uh, Middle East more vulnerable to violence. Um, I think one has to understand nonviolent as a weapon. So that is the second word. A critical understanding of the power and dynamics of nonviolent actions is crucial for those engaging in violence, Muslims and non Muslim alike. I'm citing some of these examples because these are Muslim activists in Egypt, in Algeria, elsewhere. Their argument is always the same. They say something like this. Uh, when asked why armed struggle uh, is important, they will say, we don't find any other solution. We are still open for dialogue to find a peaceful political solution, but we don't have any other choice. When I spoke with some of the insurgents or sympathizers with the insurgents in southern Thailand, the answer is always the same. We try for dialogue, but we have been oppressed. There's no other alternative. I mean, this is some of the things that uh, have been found. This is uh, another hadith that was cited by Jawdat Sayyid. For those of you who are interested, he's a Syrian philosopher. Uh, one of his work is called The Doctrines of Adam's First Son. And he said that where violence, I mean, this, he's quoting a hadith here, and say, where violence enters into something, it disgraces it. And wherever gentle civility enters into something, it graces it. Truly, God bestowed account of gentle conduct, what he does not bestow on account of violent conduct. This is Jada Sayyid say that this is a famous hadith. Now, if we argue that from an Islamic point of view, from the hadith point of view that Sayyid was talking about, then this is the effect of violence. And God himself is prescribing uh, that gentle civility is more important than the use of violence. But what is nonviolent action? When I say it's different than the my uh, peace, I was talking to Payasan and I'm talking with Ulil a moment ago. Uh, many of you know, and his book has been translated into Bahasa Indonesia, the work of Jean Sharp, Politics of Nonviolent Actions, you know that. And when I spoke with Jean, he always said that I don't like to go to peace conference. I am not a peace researcher. You know, and people are puzzled because the master of nonviolent actions, how come it's not a peace researcher? So what exactly is nonviolent action? Nonviolent actions refers to non-routine and extra institutional political acts that do not involve violence or the threat of violence. This is the definition given by Kurt Schock, I think is one of the most leading theorists of nonviolence today. And his new book is called Civil Resistance Today. It may occur through acts of omission, whereby people refuse to perform acts expectedly by norms or laws, uh, acts of commission where people perform acts which are of uh, expected, which are not expected by norms or even against the law. These actions are nonviolent when they do not threaten or directly result in people forcefully. Uh, detained against their will, injured, violated, or killed. This is what nonviolent actions is about. But as a weapon, I like this quote very much from another book that um, uh, Kurt edited. This is called uh, Civil Resistance Comparative Perspectives, coming out of University of Minnesota Press this year. And he said, violence works like a hammer why nonviolence works more like a lever. Through leverage, oppressed and marginalized actors are able to defeat repressive and more powerful opponents. The understanding that nonviolence works like a, like a lever and violence like a hammer is quite interesting. There's a saying that if you think what you're holding is a hammer, you look at everything and you see nails. 
You know, so if I'm holding a hammer, I look at Pai Ihsan, I don't see him. I see a big nail. <laughs> Not an ordinary nail, okay? So, but so, and that, that will be the way in which you deal with the world. So if nonviolence is not in a hammer, what is it? Shock argues that it is like a leverage. Why? Because this is about how you use power to change power relations. If you read Sharp's work, he has a term for it. He call it political jujitsu. Political jujitsu meaning you are using you are, in a way, destabilize the opponent. That is to say, power rests on certain pillars. There is no power that does not rest on anything. So the depiction of power, contrary to what political science teaches, political science thinks of power every time you ask a student to draw a picture of, of power in politics, in political science class, they draw, what did they draw? If I ask you to draw a representation of power in, polit in political science, what, what would be the picture? Chair. Chair. Geometric. Geometric. I think it's a triangle. Yeah? If you go back to Robert Dow, you know, you have triangle. You go back to Marx, you have triangle. And then you have the ruler and the rule, or you have the powerful and the less powerful and all that. Nonviolent action works radically different. You turn power upside down. When you turn power upside down, it's like a pyramid with the top on the ground. It could not stand unless with some pillars supporting it. So the argument made by people in nonviolent action theory and practice is that there is no power which is not based on support. If you are interested in political theory, this is John Locke's ideas of consent. Power is there because you give consent to power. So it's in there. Jokowi is in power because you give consent to Jokowi in power. But what about my government which took power through good data? <laughs> we didn't give it to him, but uh, the point is whether we wanted to take it back from him. You know, We don't give it to him but we allow him to sit on the chair, you know. So, and in that sense, you know, this is the dynamics of power. So, the argument made by nonviolent action and, uh, you know, acti activists is that if you find ways to undermine these pillars, power collapse. And that, I think, is the secret of power seen from the side of nonviolent actions. That's why it's a powerful weapon. Is this theoretical only? Why nonviolent struggle should be a preferred cause of actions for Muslims? I say that there are several reasons. One, as a weapon for social change and resistance, nonviolent actions are more effective than the use of violence. How can I say that? Don't you see, you know, violence around the world? Well, I'm not imagining things. The Indonesian food are good, but I'm still having my head clear. I'm not corrupted by that. This is based on the studies done by two researchers, Erika Shep and Maria Stepan. They conduct their studies on success and loss or defeat of nonviolent campaigns using data set covering more than 100 years. All nonviolent campaigns during the last 100 years and look at, looking at about more than 300 cases and then they found what I show there, that nonviolent campaign's rate of success is considerably more than violent campaign. And there are people using nonviolent campaign more than violent campaign. You know? And then she went on, they both went on into case studies of how some nonviolent campaign were successful, how they are not successful in certain areas. So empirically, one could argue that there is a higher success rate. So for Muslims who want to change the world, the question becomes whether you want to be successful or not. But I would argue that it's not only the success rate. I think the important thing, and since we are talking at uh, Pusat Paramedina, I think this point is very important. The choice of nonviolent action 
as a method in so for social change, I think is more conducive to democracy. The choice of violence as a method for social change, I would argue, is less conducive to democracy and more towards authoritarian regime. And that's why those interested in issue of democracy should pay more attention to the idea of nonviolent actions as a weapon. So, first thing is that it is a powerful weapon. <coughs> Second, I think nonviolent actions as a weapon is different from the use of violence. And this is the argument made by another academic activist uh, in the Nordic country, uh, I think he's Norwegian, uh, Jorgen Johansson. And the argument he made, I'm summarizing it, is that it is different from violence because it is much more targeted and discriminating. Nonviolence is more targeted and discriminating. What does that mean? Violence like this, the use of drone, and you see what happened in Afghanistan two days ago. The hospital uh, that was organized and maintained by Medicine Sans Frontier was destroyed. I think 19 people were killed by the drone, the American drone. The president came out and apologized for it. But what happens is that when you use weapons such as drone or any other weapons, what happens is that it cannot differentiate the victims from others. And as a result, many a time you have innocent life lost in the process. The military call it collateral damage. I think the term is fascinating. It's a damage, it's collateral, you have to fix it. Nonviolence is very different. Nonviolence is not only because nonviolence doesn't kill and nonviolence doesn't make you, you know, take your life away. I think differentiation quality of nonviolent actions is because it is a more realistic weapon. Why? Because it is a weapon that can differentiate your roles and functions. Violent weapons cannot. And for those of you interested in drone in particular, uh, I think Akbar Ahmad uh, has a book called The Drone and the Trissel, the Trissel and the Drone, which argues why the Muslims were so mad at the drone. Because they know the fight, they know the wars, but when they were killed by, you know, uh, an unmanned weapons like this from somewhere in Washington, directed or from somewhere by the ocean, this is almost godlike. And so it's for them, it's a fight that is uh, very humiliating in a way. Um, so the argument I'm making is that nonviolent action is much more targeted and discriminating. Meaning, meaning I suppose Pak uh, is getting richer and richer because he started a new business. And this new business, for example, is selling black diamond let's say, from Africa. And I, I, as an activist, wanted to boycott him. Then I will organize people like call Sana, director, the chair, together, and we boycott uh, the shop. But for nonviolence, you can boycott the shop, but you can collaborate with Abid Yasan on most activities. Because from nonviolent perspective, we understand that people have different roles and functions, and their bad side and good side. I think it is a reductionist notion to say that people who are different than you are completely evil. I don't believe there is such a thing as a complete evil person, nor do I believe that there is such a thing as a completely good person. We are human. We have some good, we have some bad and we have different roles, we have different functions. I don't like some of the, my friend's functions or roles, but it doesn't mean that I will not eat with him, ever. So some of these things, I mean, this is part of the problem in Thai society. I was talking to my friends a moment ago. The polarization in Thai society is so grave that today it's very difficult to have a civil conversation with those who belong to different political camps. And for me, this 
another problem of democracy because democracy is not only about election or you know good society or not, what not. Democracy is also about creating a political society with some kind of human relationships based on friendship. If you allow certain ideology to destroy all friendships, I think you have a problem in the future. So, there are some literature on Islam and nonviolence in English, and I took only four of them. The first one is by Muhammad Abu Nimer, a Palestinian teaching at American University. The second one is an edited volume, The Christian and the Death, edited by Gamma Al Huda, used to be at uh, United States Institute for Peace. The third one is an Indian writer, Islam Means Peace, by Amitabh Pal, he is the editor of The Progressive. And the fourth one is Jeffy uh, Howison, um, searching for a king, Muslim nonviolence and the future of Islam. So you have some of these studies, which I think there are some. If you look at the books, you will find Islam means peace, I mean Islam and peace, peace Islam, Islam and nonviolence, and all that. But if they come and they talk about you know how uh, uh, Islamic teaching, uh, say peace, peace, peace I feel bored with that. I'm not quite sure whether that is the direction I'm interested in, but these books are different. They talk about uh, possibilities of how we can um, encounter or think about nonviolent actions through Islamic sources and examples. Crescent and the Dirt has different examples. Um, uh, Searching for the King talks about different personalities and then you know, call this the master, the teacher, and other things, you know. Interesting. <coughs> the argument, the third one. The argument I wanted to make uh, is the following. You know, you can uh, talk about, uh, read about it. This is called uh, Eighth Thesis on Muslim Nonviolent Action. I could not see, so forgive me. I have to work. Uh, the first thesis is that for Islam, the problem of violence is an integral part of Islamic moral sphere. I am not the one who will come out and say that because Islam means peace, we are not violent. I think differently. I think for Islam, violence is within you know, the moral sphere. Violence, if any, used by Muslim, therefore, must be governed by rules prescribed in the Quran and the Hadith. Because it is within the moral sphere, then you use the standard, the criteria coming from Quran and the Hadith. Now, if violence cannot discriminate between combatants and non-combatants, then it is unacceptable in Islam. Why? Because then you will then incur innocent lives in the process. I argue that, well, the fourth thesis is modern technology of destruction renders discrimination virtually impossible at present. And you don't have to think of nuclear weapons. You know what is the weapon that is most dangerous in today's world? Do you know which is the weapon that, is, that has killed more in today's world? Do you know? AK-47. AK-47 has killed more people than, you know, atomic bombs, than, you know, the bombs combined. It, and more dangerous is AK-47 in the hands of a 10 years old boys, shy soldiers. So, modern technology like those, uh, I think, no longer discriminates. In the modern world, Muslims cannot use violence. If that is the, you know, consequence, then we cannot use violence. Then what can we do? Do we? Does it mean that we accept everything as is? I think Islam teaches Muslims to fight for justice with the understanding that human lives as all parts of God's creation are purposive and sacred. And then in order to be true to Islam, Muslims must then utilize nonviolent action as a new mode of struggle. I mean, from the Islamic imperative, and Islam itself, I argue, is a fertile soil for nonviolence because of its potential for disobedience. Islam is a religion of obedience, but we obey God, not humans. So it is in itself a potential for disobedience, strong discipline. You know, this is a religion that wakes people up at dawn and make ablution and then go to perform salah. 
so sharing and responsib social responsibility, the notion of zakat. Perseverance, this is sound. Puasa in Ramadan. And then self-sacrifice. And then the belief in the unity of the Muslim community and the oneness of mankind. Maybe the hearts. So all of this combined, I argue that if the, according to this thesis, then we have to find alternative. And I argue that in Islam, there's a fertile soil for nonviolent action this way. And then there are two core values. Second argument. In the, in the book, I talk about the prophetic example of compassion, as you know. Uh, the Quran said that uh, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was sent to God as uh, Rahmatul Lil Alamin, so the whole world, uh, Rahmat for the whole world. But the creativity part is interesting. I'm sure you all know the story. I don't know whether anyone, when uh, giving um, sermon, talks about that, but the, the the uh, um, the, the, the conflict at the uh, of the camp among the Quraysh. The conflict uh, among the Quraysh is about how you put the Hayur Aswad in its place. And at that time, the prophet was not the prophet yet; he was not 40 years old. There was a conflict. They rebuilt the Kaaba after the flood, and they wanted to put the Hayur Aswad in its place. But the person who will put it in the place is the most honorable. And they cannot agree. So some chieftains begin to draw sword. Then one old person, you know, wise one, with gray hair like you, and say that, and we were talking about it, and say that, okay, let's wait until we, uh, the person walk into the, the gate, and then we let him decide. The person walk into the gate happened to be Muhammad. And everyone was very happy. Oh, but the guy who walked into the gate, Babu Sofa, was Muhammad. He's Al Amin. Let him decide. The prophet, in his wisdom and creativity, what he did was that he did not pick anyone. What he did was that he took off his cloak, put it on the floor, and let everyone lift the whole, I mean, he was in the, the, in the coast, and everyone lift together. One can argue is a way in which you don't pick anyone, because you can, you know, pick certain person, but the rest of people will not be happy for example. And this is a creative notion of nonviolent resolution to conflict, to prevent conflict. The third argument is tracing Islam in Gandhi's Ahimsa. If you read some of the book, including Amitabh Pal and others, what he had done is that he went back to Gandhi's um, life and mothers and said that she belongs to a clan where uh, it's infused Hinduism and Islam, and so Gandhi was very fond of Islam and whatnot. Um, but my question is another thing. I was puzzling at the independence movement in India, and I asked myself, yes, Gandhi talks about that he read the Quran, that he likes Islam and whatnot, but that doesn't explain. Empirically, the interesting thing is that when people went to jail, the British jail, there were more than 12,000 Muslims who went to jail. Why? Is it because Gandhi convinced him, convinced them, or because these Muslims saw within Gandhi some kind of, I would say, trace of Islam injunctions in the work of non -Muslims? And it, I argue that maybe it is. And this is a quote from Gandhi Ahimsa. He said, my nonviolence, fully accommodated violence, offered by those who did not feel nonviolence. This is Gandhi. He did not say that everyone should be nonviolent. And who had in their keeping the honor of their women, folk, and little children? Meaning, if your sister, mother is being attacked, and you don't want to use nonviolence, you better do something to defend the honor. Even violence is better. Nonviolence is not a cover for cowardice, it is the supreme virtue of the brave. Translation from softmanship to nonviolence is possible and at times even an easy stage. Nonviolence therefore presupposes ability to strike. So nonviolence is far from passivity. And vouch for Gandhi's truth in this regard because when I conduct training on nonviolence to different groups of people, you know which groups I find most difficult and which group is the easiest? The group that I find most easiest in 
accepting or at least thinking about nonviolence are the military. The groups that are most difficult are teachers and religious leaders. There must reason that. Argument number four. Contemporary examples of Muslim nonviolent actions, so many in Indonesia, you know, the, of Rita Pankabin and at UKM and many others. I cited some examples from uh, nonviolent protests of, at Patani Central Mosque 2007, the Arab Spring in 2011 in Syria, in uh, Egypt and other places. Um, now, there are incidents of nonviolent action. It doesn't mean everything there is nonviolent. But uh, another interesting thing, there are so many Muslim Gandhis. You heard of frontier Gandhi, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, you know, who worked with Gandhi, who is, who symbolized uh, nonviolence of the brave, who started the Kudai Kitmatkar, uh, the red the soldiers, um, you know, who fought the British with nonviolence, but also in South Africa, we heard only of Nelson Mandela and Bishop Tutu. Have you heard of Fatima Mir? She is considered the South African Gandhi. She passed away, I think a year or so. And then in Sub-Sahara, you have the Sub-Sahara human rights uh, activist, Aminatu Haider. It's quite interesting that you have so many Gandhis who are Muslim. I'm not talking about relationship, I'm talking about uh, the, you know, the, the name given by the public to them. Whereas, if you talk about the French Gandhi, do you know who he is? The guy who burned down McDonald's. Yeah. And these people did not burn down anything, so to speak. So that's different. Argument number five, transforming terrorism with Muslim nonviolent action. This is a critically important and I think a timely issue at the moment. Um, the argument I make is this. Uh, people ask me, what are you going to do with terrorism? Can nonviolent action do anything about terrorism? There are studies of uh, nonviolence reaction to terrorism, like the work of Tom Hastings, uh, K. Kurea Gates, and others. Uh, my argument is the possibility that nonviolent action to undermine terrorism. Not because nonviolent action is different from terrorism, but because it is similar. Why? The logic of, you see, terrorism in itself, terrorism in itself like violence, um, most of the time is done in the name of the good. I conducted uh, research on killers, people who kill for profession. And I thought when I started to do that, that these guys do things for money. Not so. The killer told me, one guy told me that you know, he's a high gun. And he said, when I accepted the job, I had to have some kind of reason why this guy should be killed. So the tycoon gave me the money to kill this person. Then he will be taken to the house of that person, the, the target. And then he will, uh, other people will tell him, you know, this guy is a bad guy. This guy cheated the tycoon. And then this guy, you know, sometimes said, this guy was even bad to, your, to, to his mother. Give him the reason why he should kill. Tourism also is the same. A lot of times you look at all of this and you find that terrorism is done in the name of justice because people are oppressed. Um, there's a study of uh, suicide bombers and there's a, I remember the quote and the guy who was about to, to uh, they have tapes of him before he started uh, to go and detonate himself. And he said that, I did this for the love of Palestine, I did this for the love of God, I did it for uh, Hamas, I did it so that people will no longer be oppressed. All the right reasons. So, in, in other words, it's similar to nonviolence, it works for the idea of justice. The other thing which is important is the relationship between nonviolence and the notion of death. 
for Gandhi, for those who are interested in nonviolence, one thing that you do is that you prepare to die in that sense. Like suicide bomber. What is the difference? The difference is that for terrorism, that's, they don't care about innocent lives. For terrorism, they don't they use violence as an instrument. I think for nonviolence and for Islam, those two cannot be accepted. Argument six. If these are the case, you know, you have examples of nonviolence in, in contemporary Islam, you have the hadith, you have the text. You have, uh, you know, examples, you have argument. Then why is it that people do not come to, to nonviolence? I argue that this is because of the modern jahiliya. I call it jahiliya factor. And this is cultural resistance to nonviolent actions among Muslims, result from several things. Partly linguistic. In the Arab world, if I understand correctly, the word for nonviolence is la'amf. And when you say la'am, a lot of people mean understand it to be doing nothing. And they cannot accept it. So the idea of nonviolence translated this way would not sell in, in the Arab world. They have to change the term. That's why in uh, the books that I show you, uh, a new term, not new term, the term used is civil resistance. Civil resistance is being used now, even in Arabic and in other places. Second thing is blindness to Muslim histories of nonviolent actions. Khalid Kishtaini is an Iraqi writer. One of the things he showed us is that if you look at the history of Islam, it's amazing because we do not leave behind warrior caste. There's no warrior caste in Islam. We do not leave behind you know, great generals, maybe with the exception of Khalid bin Walid. The rest, you, you don't know. You don't leave behind, you know, the art of war and things like that. What do Arab Muslim culture leave behind? You know, cushions, uh, clothes, and things like that. So nothing about violence. Very, you know, it's not in the cultural legacy at all. And then lack of understanding of theory and practice of nonviolence as effective political actions. I think this is the area that I'm interested in at the moment in trying to talk to or persuade people to pay attention to nonviolent actions more. Now, engaging the world with nonviolence and the Islamic imperatives, what does that mean? When the world suffered from 9-11-2001, it gave birth to the global war on terror. It gave birth to the attack on uh, invasion of Afghanistan, invasion of Iraq, and then you had, you know, destroy uh, the whole country and civilization, and you have refugees problem and others, and spill over, as you can see. And we can talk about it in our discussion, but on September 11, more than a hundred years ago, 1906, Gandhi called a mass meeting of some 3,000 Transvaal India, Indians to find ways to resist the Registration Act. The British passed the Registration Act. 3,000 people attending the meeting were one shared Haji Habib, an old Muslim president of South Africa. Gandhi began his career not in India, but in South Africa. He was an employee to a Muslim company in South Africa. Shared Habib said to the congregation that the Indians had to pass this resolution with God as witness and could never yield a cowardly submission to such a degrading legislation, disobedience, citing the name of God, willing to accept the consequences. Gandhi said, I did not come to the meeting with a view to getting the resolution passed in that manner, which redounds to the credit of Sheikh Haji Habib, as well as it lays a burden of responsibility upon him. I tender my congratulation to him I deeply appreciate it. I deeply appreciate his suggestion, but if you adopt it, you too will share his responsibility. This is Gandhi's own writing in Satyakraha in South Africa, 1928 or something. Uh, the book came later. So he is crediting Sheikh Habib as the 
the person responsible for the advent of Satyakra, which is the greatest, one of the greatest uh, nonviolent movement that un that uh, you know successfully uh, brought to India uh, independence and also the birth of Pakistan. What does it mean, 109 years later, to remember this other 9-11? I think remembering the nonviolent 9-11 a century ago also means remembering the Muslim role in fostering such an alternative, a practice of nonviolence and Islamic imperatives at the advent of Satyagraha or Gandhi's nonviolence that later on influenced a century of nonviolent struggle around the world. When people talk about Gandhis in relation to Islam or Islam in relation to nonviolence and India, very few remember that. I think there is a need for us to look at facts like this and try to bring it to the fore. To understand the role that we play, we, I mean Muslim, play in shaping, you know, a a better world, a just world, a world where we fight against colonialism, imperialism, but do nonviolent action at the advent of uh, the last century. And so, you know, this is our contribution, and there is a need to remember that. The quest a good question would be, why is it that we forget all these things? Why was it hidden? But choice, last one. Tragedies can be resolved in one of two ways. There is the Shakespearean resolution and there is the Chekhovian one. This is the coming from Amos Oz. But what does it mean, Shakespearean and Chekhovian? At the end of a Shakespearean tragedy, the stage is thrown with dead bodies. You look at Macbeth, Hamlet and others. Uh, and maybe there's some justice hovering high above. A, Chekhov, uh, a Chekhovian tragedy, on the other hand, ends with everybody disillusioned, embittered, heartbroken, disappointed, absolutely shattered, but still alive. One has to choose between a Shakespearean or a Chekhovian end. For a Muslim, transcending Shakespearean or Chekhovian choices is possible, I would argue, with nonviolent actions where lives can be better saved while the possibility of upholding a just world in line with Islamic teachings could still be possible. And so we don't have to choose between Shakespeare and Shakespeare. We can have our own path based on knowledge, inspiration, look at the world, then we build a new world based on this nonviolent course, which is also Islamic imperatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for your very inspiring lecture this evening. Saya diminta untuk meringkas pemaparan dari Professor Shaiwat dalam bahasa Indonesia. With your with your permission, I would like to present a summary. I hope it's it just to your. Thank you. Tisu utama dari pemaparan Professor Shaiwat ini adalah Uh, Tisu utama dari pema uh, pemaparan Profesor Shaiwat hari ini adalah uh, pencarian alternatif nif kekerasan akan memungkinkan kaum muslim untuk berpegang pada dua prinsip dasar Islam memelihara nyawa yang tak berdosa seraya melawan ketidakadilan di dunia Untuk mendukung argumen ini Profesor Shaiwat mendefinisikan aksi nif kekerasan sebagai berikut ini Aksi politik di luar yang rutin dan institusional yang tidak melibatkan tindak kekerasan atau ancaman kekerasan. Perlu dicatat juga bahwa Profesor Shaiwat membedakan antara aksi nir kekerasan dengan perdamaian karena aksi nir kekerasan merupakan alat berkonflik yang kuat berdasarkan pada penolakan untuk pasif dan tunduk tidak bergantung pada asumsi bahwa orang 
pada dasarnya baik dan orang yang menggunakannya tidak perlu menjadi seorang pasifis atau orang suci. Uh, di sini Profesor Syaiwat ibaratkan kekerasan sebagai um, senjata yang bisa, bisa dikatakan seperti palu uh, dan tindakan ini kekerasan seperti tuas yang bisa digunakan untuk mengubah hubungan kekuasaan uh, untuk memperjuangkan ketidakadilan. Profesor uh, Syaiwat menyampaikan argumen utamanya dari dua sudut pandang. Pertama, sebagai peneliti perdamaian, Profesor Syaiwat berpendapat bahwa secara praktis, taktik-taktik nir kekerasan merupakan senjata yang sangat kuat untuk melawan ketidakadilan berdasarkan dua alasan. Pertama, sebagai senjata, perlawanan dan perubahan sosial aksi nir kekerasan jauh lebih efektif ketimbang aksi kekerasan. Misalnya, beberapa penelitian mutakhir yang diikuti oleh Profesor Syaiwat Uh, menunjukkan bahwa antara tahun uh, 1900 sampai 2006 kampanye perlawanan di kekerasan hampir dua kali uh, lebih berhasil dibanding kampanye uh, perlawanan, perlawanan dengan kekerasan Kedua, aksi nir kekerasan sebagai senjata berbeda dari aksi kekerasan dipandang dari pemeliharaan sasaran Beda dari senjata kekerasan yang dirancang untuk membunuh membunuh sasaran, tapi kadang juga memakan korban yang tak berdosa. Aksi-aksi nir kekerasan adalah senjata yang dapat membeda-bedakan antara peran seseorang dalam hidup dan kegiatan-kegiatan sebagai manusia. Sesuatu yang tidak bisa dilakukan oleh senjata kekerasan manapun. Yang kedua, dari sudut yang uh, uh, Profesor Syaiwat atau da dari, dari sudut sebagai uh, seorang peneliti perdamaian muslim uh, Profesor Syaibat mengajak sesama muslim untuk uh, menelah secara kritis alternatif-alternatif nir kekerasan dengan mengambil inspirasi dari kitab suci Al-Quran surat Al-Ma'idah ayat ke-32 yang paling sering dirujukan uh, berkenaan dengan Islam dan nir kekerasan terjemahan uh, ayat tersebut adalah sebagai berikut ini Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Oleh karena itu kami tetapkan satu hukum bagi Bani Israel bahwa barang siapa yang membunuh seorang manusia bukan karena orang itu membunuh orang lain atau bukan karena berbuat kerusakan di muka bumi maka seakan-akan dia telah membunuh seluruh umat manusia tapi barang siapa memelihara kehidupan seorang manusia maka seakan-akan dia telah memelihara kehidupan segenap umat manusia Menurut Profesor uh, Chaiwat, ayat Al-Quran ini menunjukkan bahwa prinsip nir kekerasan dalam Islam didasarkan pada bagaimana nyawa seorang manusia disetarakan dengan nyawa seluruh umat manusia dan memelihara kehidupan yang tak bersyarat ini jauh lebih utama ketimbang mengambil nyawa dengan syarat yang sangat berat. Tetapi di sisi lain, ayat ini juga menunjukkan dilema besar yang sedang dihadapi oleh kaum muslim secara umum pada saat ini. Di satu sisi, Islam mengajarkan kaum muslim untuk melawan ketidakadilan, namun di sisi lain, Islam juga mengatur tata tindakan dan tidak, tidak, tidak diperbolehkan dalam melakukan perlawanan. Yang menjadi sisis buku ini adalah, bahwa, uh, adalah uh, untuk mengatasi dilema tersebut, perlu ada aksi-aksi nir kekerasan yang memungkinkan kaum muslim untuk melawan uh, ketidakadilan sekaligus melindungi memelihara nyawa orang-orang yang tak berdosa jadi dengan menggunakan kekerasan sebagai strategi um, uh, Profesor Syaibat menggunakan uh, ibarat yang sangat menarik uh, orang umat muslim bisa menghindari kedua tragedi kedua bentuk tragedi yaitu Shakespearean tragedy dan juga uh, Jacobian tragedy um, saya rasa Uh, uh, brief, uh, so cukup di sini saja. Uh, mungkin langsung bisa berdiskusi uh, dengan Profesor Syaiwat. Uh, nanti jika ada pertanyaan atau tanggapan dalam bahasa Indonesia, uh, saya bisa terjemahkan. I can translate the questions from the audience.